Neville, first of all, I'd just like to ask you um, to focus on the book initially. Um, I, I can imagine for you it must have been a bit of a cathartic process of, of looking back through your career and some of the memories and and com- kind of combining it to the work you do now. How much of a pleasure was it for you to, to look back at and to write the book in combination with James? Well, I think it was a pleasure for me. I'm not sure about James. You know, I think James found it hard because I'm one of them people that's sort of he would be asking me specific stuff and I'd just wander off to a different different place. So it was, it was, I think it was a lot harder for James than it was for me. Yeah, it was, it was good, but I think it came come at the right time as well. I think the timing of it is important for me. I think sometimes I didn't really want to do a book when I was 12 mm. or 14 or 19 or 20. I wanted to do a book when I was ready to do a book. Mm. And I think meeting James is a stroke of fortune and I think it was lucky that I got the opportunity really because he's... What I do like about me is in my words, how I speak, mm. which I think was important to me as well. Um, as a footballer, obviously a footballer's career is relatively short and um, you've gone on to do lots of things after, after which maybe weren't so much publicised in the media or not a lot of fans, football fans, weren't aware of the work you're doing now. Was that kind of a motivation behind the book as well to kind of raise awareness of, of, of the work you're doing with disengaged youths now as well? No, not really. It was That's just a byproduct of my life. Really. I mean, a short career, 20 years, I don't think it's that short, do Mm. In all fairness, so I think no, it's it's something I drifted into and it's something I'm proud of, and it wouldn't be an end of the book really without without including that. So I do think there's got to be a start, there's got to be a middle, and there's got to be an end. And I think lots of football books go bloody bloody blah, blah, played this, played that, played that. And I get bored reading them. You know, so I mean, I, I'm a great reader. I read four books a week sometimes, all at different stages. Um, I read lots of sports books and the, the, ones, the ones that are really good are the people that have something else apart from football in their lives. You know, like the old ones used to be through the war and stuff like that. I really enjoy them because they've got something else to say. I think a lot of the others have got nothing else to say because of from 14 they were going to be a footballer and when they're 30 they retired and that was it. So they only got that bit to talk about. So I find them quite bland. And I thought mine was, because it didn't start until I was sort of 1920, and I finished when I was 40 odd. So I had a bit more to say afterwards as well. So I wanted to make sure I covered everything, and rather than, you know, I hate, I hate it when I read books that go, I got up in the morning, played a cup final, went to bed, happy days. You know, because they're too bland and it doesn't tell me what I want to tell me. And I've been really disappointed in a lot of books because I, I want to see how they prepare for things, and you know, like boxers, I like to see how they prepare for the fight and, and what they do. And, it's quite, it's they're quite disappointing some of them because sometimes they're thrown together because the people there are, are famous for a short space of time, and so they just turn the book out with no real thought about no real quality in the book. And we wanted it to be a, a nice read, but truthful as well, you know, honest, and put my personality across really. And mm. I do think people see you in goal and just think that's all there is to your life. Mm. And Neville, just staying on the subject of modern day football, um, if you were in a governing body position where you, you could influence the game, or would there be things that you would immediately change, or is there anything that springs to mind which you'd love to love to implement in the modern game? Maybe something from what was around when, when you were playing? Well, I think the first thing i do is say, right, whatever decision the referee makes is final. Whether he's good or bad, it doesn't matter. And if you go around the referee and you, you abuse the referee, I'd, I'd make sure that you had a space around the referee and if you encroach in that space, you'd be booked. And I think yeah, if there's any diving, I'd book him and I'd, and I'd make sure that I'd book him in retrospect as well. Because I'd make somebody watch the games and, and if they dived, I'd make sure they they, uh, they got booked. And, they, and if they got fouled and he jumped up and there was nothing wrong with him, I'd also book him. Mm. <laughs> yeah. If the physio doesn't come on, they jump up. And they, I just think there's just too much today. And I didn't realise how much of an effect it had until I finished playing. And I went to watch a few kids games. Mm. And the kids all do that now. Mm. And if, that, if that's the kind of thing we're sending to our kids, that's wrong. And I do think it, it needs sorted out. And I do think that we've got to accept that referees are not going to be perfect. Because the players aren't. And the managers certainly aren't. So we've got to say, look, do we believe our managers are, are our referees are honest? If they're honest, and we say they're honest, and whatever decisions they make are honest mistakes and, and uh, so we just break up with them mm. and uh, there's nothing you can do about it the, the, the problem is is that the money's overtook the honesty in football and that's that's the biggest problem is that honesty is no longer it's got to be guaranteed now and the, the decisions have got to be guaranteed and i think that's wrong i think it's a better game when you go 
he's made a mistake and he's made a mistake. You know, I know it cost your club 50 million, but on some stage that fella's doing the best he can. Honestly, we're never going to have robots, so it's a human game, and I think it's it's one of the things we, can, we need to address that people are honest. And I do think we just sort of go, no, he might be shit, but he's at least he's honest. You know, and I do think the referees have made a run for their own back, taking the money. Mm. They should have stayed part time because mm. they know better for me. Yeah, and the work you do with a lot of youths now, um, obviously a lot of them love football. Um, do, do you find that when they're looking for role models in, in the game, perhaps they're not there now for, for, for young people? Well, I think first of all, they don't go on the players, they go on the money. Mm. And that's the biggest thing. I mean, they don't. If you look at somebody and say, the first thing is, oh, look how much he earns. Mm. Not what he can do and how good he is, it's like. How much does he earn? And that's that's the thing for most people now is they all want to have money. They all want to be rich quick. And I do think it's one of them societies. I know I sound really old fashioned now, but I believe that if you're good at something, you really you learn your craft. You know, and I do believe that if you're if you're a musician you spend hours being a musician. Mm. If you suddenly become a great musician, you you, be, you become one overnight by by working out, you know, and working and working and working at your craft and I think they don't appear to put enough effort in these days to work at the craft, and I think people get pissed off at it. Mm. I think people have had enough of people who, who one, don't know anything about the club, they don't know about the history of the club, they don't know, they don't care about the people in the club, they're just there for their cash, and to play, if they don't play every week, then they're not that bothered. And I do think the pride and the, the dignity have gone out of a lot of it, and I just think people have now disenchanted with footballers because they don't seem to be trying as much as what they used to. And, uh, I think that's... The problem with footballers at the moment is because they earn so much money that people guarantee that they didn't want. Well, assume that they don't earn their money by just they don't do enough. And I, I think in some cases they're right. And I'd like to see somehow at the bigger clubs don't take all the money. I'd like to see them, if they're so good with people, I'd like to see the season ticket money come down. It never seems to. I'd like to see at least one free game a season for all the fans that go. And not a shitty game, not a Coventry at home. Like a real good team at home where they can come and enjoy it for nothing. And what I'd most like to see is that the players put each put a hundred quid a week into a charity and a local charity. And even if there's twenty five people, thirty people the staff. Now that's a lot of cash for a small charity each week. So so each week they can be given like three grand away to a charity. And I think if you, if at the moment you could probably put a month's worth of money into buying food for the people of Liverpool mm. and the food banks and that. And that sent a good signal out as well. So they, for me, they they don't do enough for the people that really matter. And I, I think you can't keep producing new shirts. You can't keep producing new stuff. You've got to say, hang on a minute, people are struggling here. Yeah? And there doesn't seem to be any understanding of people struggling. You know, they seem to be like, well, you're going to do this, and whether you like it or not. I think the fans need to have a bigger say in football as well. I do believe they, somewhere, somewhere, they need to speak to Sky as a supporters body and say, look. You can't have an 11 o'clock kickoff or a half 11 kickoff or a 1 o'clock kickoff or a 8 o'clock kickoff at Southampton away on a Monday night. Mm. It's just not feasible for the people to be there. And surely the whole point of all football matches is that for the players is that they fill the grounds. Mm. And I don't really want to turn the telly on. I see a ground half empty. Nobody does. Because mm. you, you know what you get off Sky, yeah. You, you want people through the turnstiles. It's always been the same. Players want people through the turnstiles. And I want to create a good atmosphere. And I think it's only the fans who get ripped off. And it's it's always been the case since I was in football. Fans get ripped off all the time, and you're damned if you do, and you're damned if you don't. As a fan, if you don't go, you're the only one that suffers. The club don't suffer, do they? Somehow. Mm. So there's got to be, a, I think there's got to be a way of bridging that gap somehow. Mm. Whether whether they have a, a proper supporters club, you know, maybe they pick somebody that liaises with the club and actually puts all these concerns to them, put them, put them to Sky as well, and puts them to the FA, and and maybe have a bit more of a say rather than, you know. Who picks a World Cup in Qatar? Mm. How many fans are going to go there? Mm. Uh, just really rounding off, um, right. Neville, um, just the role of Evertonians um, at Everton Football Club. Mm. Obviously, they've played a big role in your career. You've had a great relationship with them down the years. What, how would you describe them as fans how, and your relationship with them? Do you think that they're special? Are they unique, do you think? Well, I think they just proved they're unique. I think after... If you get any other club in the world that hasn't won anything for 10 years and a manager's in a good position and nobody's on his back, I think that says everything about it. And I do I do think Liverpool's unique in a way that 
I can't think of another city. Probably Portsmouth, maybe. Where the people have put up with so much. You know, the, the Germans tried to bomb them. Successive governments have tried to kill the city. And it survived all of that. And I think, I think Liverpool is one of the places where it, the team should reflect it. Where you're passionate about what you do. You're aggressive in what you want to get. You've got a touch of class, but you're so determined that and above all you've got a fantastic sense of humour I think if the club can reflect the people it'll go a long way you know? and I think at times the only time I can actually think of it actually all coming together was by me in a cup semi final and I think that was a night when it all came together and, and the game actually affected the city and the people and when I think of Liverpool I think of people who put a lot of class who worked the bollocks off who were determined who never backed down but above all they, they can find humour in absolutely everything and I think you take a club, like I say, you won't anything for 10 years and you think the manager is such a strong position, I don't think it's anywhere near the praise it deserves because if we'd have gone and said, well, they're shouting all sorts of rubbish, there'd have been all other people. Mm. No one was actually caught on to the fact that after 10 years, you've shown that much patience in somebody. It's incredible. Mm. I think it's incredible. It's, a, it's really a shining light to the rest of the football.